Before I begin, I want to warn you. The video we're diving in today is truly a testament to how cruel we as human beings can be. Through our animalistic behaviors, you get to see that we're really not much different from the other species living amongst us. Our large complex brain just allows us to develop advanced tools, culture, and languages, therefore putting us at the top of the evolutionary ladder, aka the apex predator. As I was saying earlier, this will be a very dark video. When I first came across this story, hearing about the details made my stomach turn. This is not for the faint hearted. Tune in as I take a look at how Franz Dutois and Thunes Kruger fell into the depths of a lost society. I couldn't find much on the origin of either Dutois or Kruger, and I spent a lot of days scavenging all corners of the internet. So I'm just going to include other details about their character, their early life and upbringing. Just keep in mind it will be missing things like date of birth and place of birth, which I normally like to include in my videos. Let's begin. Growing up, you would never guess that such a nice boy could inhabit such demons. Although Franz Dutois was raised with Christian values, around the age of just 13, Dutois began showing a fascination to Satanism and believed that he had an evil side a fact that will become more apparent as the story progresses. While he was in grade eight, he set fire to a dormitory because he claimed he was listening to heavy metal and was influenced by hidden messages. He was expelled for this incident, but his parents soon moved to another town the next year anyway. It was here in the town of Adelaide, 93 miles northeast of Port Elizabeth, where he met a girl who he claimed was a witch. He said that she conducted rituals during which demons manifested. At some point, Dutois claimed that he had become possessed. Dutois was lazy at school, failing standard grade 9 twice. His parents sent him to the army where he passed a total of three months of his time in detention. His parents helped him to obtain a job at a mine where he married a woman and fathered a daughter. He later left them because his wife didn't satisfy him sexually. He then moved to Port Elizabeth where his parents again helped him with employment this time as a driver for a chain of stationary shops. After he was fired following the discovery that he had stolen money, after he was fired following the discovery that he had stolen money, he opened a she being which is a place where you go to sell and buy illegal alcohol. This is where Dutois would meet Kruger. Kruger did not have an ideal upbringing. His father had left his mother shortly after she got pregnant. She married another questionable character who stayed in his life only long enough to provide Kruger with his name. She married again, and they moved to Titsukama on the southeast coast. The instability in his home would pour into Kruger's life. It's rumored that he seriously contemplated suicide on more than one occasion. At school, the other children called him three tit because of a third nipple. It didn't seem that he really found any acceptance anywhere and got involved in drugs and alcohol. After grade 10, he left school and joined the army. Kruger would later meet Dutois in the latter Sheebin where I described earlier as a place you would go to buy alcohol. Kruger confided in Dutois as he was slightly older than he were, and both shared a common interest in Satanism and demons. Dutois was a master narcissistic manipulator and Kruger was easily persuaded. And by this time, Dutois had already committed a rape and the two of them getting together would soon prove to be a recipe for a disaster. They fueled each other's sick, twisted fantasies of assaulting and murdering innocent young girls. On one occasion, they left the victim so badly wounded, the media could only describe it as being satanic. On the morning of 18 December 1994, Alison Botha woke up excited and eager to spend some enjoyable time with her friends. She got dressed and made her way to the beach. After a couple of hours playing in the sand, the group decided to head back to Allison's house for pizza and games. Once the party was over, Allison's friends all left and went back to their homes with the remainder of one friend who Allison had agreed to take home earlier that day. She also had some laundry to pick up at her friend's house, so she figured two birds, one stone. After dropping off the friend, Allison made her way back home. By now, it was already getting late into the night. She made it home to see that her usual parking spot that was adjacent to her apartment unit was taken so she had to park a little further away. This was either a decoy to lure Allison right where they needed her to be, 
or just a case of bad luck. Within minutes of parking the car, Allison turned to grab her laundry. Before stepping out of the car, she was approached by a man wielding a knife. He put the blade to her throat and ordered her to get to the passenger side. He then quietly entered the vehicle and told Allison that he just needed to borrow her car for like an hour to run some errands. He tried making small talk with Allison, like asking her what her name is and if she was in a relationship, to which Allison lied. Allison would give the strange man a false name and told him that her boyfriend was actually at home waiting for her arrival. Allison even pleaded for him to just take the car and let her go, that she wouldn't even report it to the authorities. Dutois refused and kept saying he just wanted some company as he was going to pick up a friend. He then lied and told her that his name was Clinton. Allison was terrified the entire time but remained hopeful. He picked up his friend and they drove to a deserted place with no street lights. Both the guys then took turns, raping her violently, assaulting her multiple times. And Allison just laid there like a rag doll with no emotions, believing that if she just let them do as they pleased to her, she would walk away from it. But unfortunately, Dutois and Kruger had other plans in mind. After they was done pleasuring themselves, one of the guys began to strangle Allison, which caused her to urinate herself. She was then dragged out of the car and put onto the ground. Relieved, believing the worst was over, Allison felt a brief moment of peace. But Kruger and Dutois weren't done just yet. They were frustrated that Allison was still clinging on to life after being suffocated. The men took a knife and began stabbing her in the abdomen and pelvic area repeatedly. After stabbing Allison over 30 times, one of the men noticed her leg was still twitching. Infuriated by this discovery, they decided to finish the job by slicing at her neck repeatedly. All Allison could see was a hand going back and forth, and his movements were followed by a wet sound. It was the sound of her flesh being slashed open. In an attempt to behead Allison, she suffered over 16 slashes to her throat. The men then stepped back and admired their work. One of them even asking, you think she's dead? Which the other replied, oh yeah, no one can survive that. Satisfied from their bloodlust, Kruger and Dutois discarded their clothes and left. But little would they know, Allison would live to tell her story. While lying on the ground, she began hearing a wheezing sound which she realized was from her damaged windpipe. Believing that she wasn't going to live the ordeal, Allison decided to write down the names of her attackers in the dirt. You see, remember I told you earlier that Dutois had lied about his name being Clinton? Well, after they committed the assault, they really believed she was dead and started addressing one another by their real names. Beneath the names of her attackers, she wrote, I love mom. Soon, Allison realized she might have a chance at surviving. In the distance, she could see headlights piercing through the bushes. If she could just manage to get onto the road, someone might be able to help her. Allison dragged herself up. As she began walking, her head started to fall backwards. It was almost severed off. She tried to reach for her head and ended up touching the inside of her throat. She had to use one of her hands to hold her head up. As she started to take a couple more steps, she then realized something slimy was poking out of her belly. It was her intestines falling out of her abdomen. She had to use her other hand to hold her internal organs in place while she made her way to the road. She fell many times, but miraculously managed to get back up and regain consciousness. She finally made it to a road where she collapsed along the white lines, believing that it would attract the attention of a motorist. Allison's luck would start to change because shortly after, a young veterinary student named Tien Elard who was visiting Port Elizabeth on vacation from Johannesburg, saw Botha, saw Allison lying on the ground in the middle of the road and stopped. God put me on that road that night for a reason, Ehlert later said. He used his veterinary training to tuck Allison's exposed thyroids back inside her body. Then he called emergency services for help. Allison was rushed to the hospital where doctors were stunned by her horrific wounds. One doctor later said that he'd never seen such severe injuries in his 16 years of practice in medicine. Allison survived unimaginable injuries and managed to recover fully, even remembering every detail about her attackers. She was soon able to identify them from police pictures, 
while she was still in the hospital bed. This led to the speedy arrest of the duel. Franz and Kruger were arrested. They had already been arrested twice for two different rape charges. They were actually out on bail when they tried to murder Allison. The police went to the hospital and showed a folder of photos to Allison. She picked out the photos of Franz and Kruger and wrote their names on them. She couldn't talk because she had a tube going down her throat. The police returned in the afternoon and said that the prosecutors wanted Allison to verbalize Franz and Kruger's names to build a stronger case. The doctors were horrified because for her to talk, they had to remove the tube from her lungs through her trachea that they had just operated on because it was going through her vocal cords. They said speaking through the tube would be too painful and might jeopardize the good work they did on her and that she might even die. But Allison was so brave and determined, she wrote on the paper asking the doctors to take the tube out, so they did. And once it was taken out, she told the police her attackers were Franz and Kruger. Franz and Kruger let their first and second victim walk free, and the victim went to the police, which they were arrested for. That's why they wanted to murder Allison to make sure they didn't get caught. After Franz and Kruger were arrested for kidnapping, rape, and attempted murder of Allison, Franz kept claiming that a demon is trapped inside his body and told him to do all those horrible things. The police saw right through him. Even during the trial, Franz kept insisting that he is Satan and it was Satan who possessed him to do all those things to Allison. Judge Chris Jansen sentenced Franz and Kruger to life in prison without the chance of parole. However, due to a political decision, all prisoners who were sentenced prior to October 2004 were eligible for parole. In October of 2015, it was determined they would not be out on parole, but they would have the chance of parole every two years. Allison was told that she would never be able to have children due to the extent of her injuries, but this incredible woman got married and went on to have two sons. And another cool fact in the story is the the man, the veterinary student who found her in the middle of the road, later became a gynecologist and was the one who delivered her second son. Today, Alison Bata is known worldwide for her motivational speeches. She had a movie about her life and has written two books. She frequently travels to different countries speaking openly about rape. I'm just glad this story had somewhat of a happy ending. I can't believe there are actually people out there willing to prey on an innocent girl for no reason other than to pleasure their own grotesque fantasies. These kind of people, in my opinion, deserve to spend the rest of their lives rotting away at the bottom of the worst prison we can find. If you made it here, I just want to say thank you guys for watching, and also a big thank you to everyone who subscribed to the channel. I really appreciate the positive comments. Till next time.